This is Kent Blackhurst, and thanks for tuning in to part nine of Fasten Your Seatbelts for the Second Coming series. This segment ties everything we've spoken about in previous videos together. I was set to cover the millennium in this segment, but I feel constrained to review many of the events I've spoken of in the past and add many new insights of recently fulfilled prophecy to line everything up for a clearer picture of where we are now in the Lord's prophesied timeline. I hope to solidify in our hearts and minds that the time is running out before the world gets even more tumultuous. I'm interpreting prophetic scriptures and utterances in the light of current world events under the lens of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I don't ask you to take my word for it. Rather, study, ponder, and pray regarding these things for yourself. That is the best way for anyone to receive spiritual confirmation. Compare the scriptures I go over with recent occurrences in the world in which we live. During this presentation, I mainly refer to the scriptures of those who've seen our day and vision. Things are happening now, at an accelerated pace without most of the world noticing or understanding. And I'd like to reference what Elder Neil L. Anderson stated from the October General Conference in 2022. He said, Toward the end of his ministry, Jesus' disciples asked him to tell them of the sign of his second coming and of the end of the world. Jesus told them of the conditions that would precede his return and concluded by declaring, when ye shall see all these things, you will know that the time is near. In the last general conference, I listened very closely to the words of President Henry B. Eyring. Each of us, he said, wherever we are, knows that we live in increasingly perilous times. Anyone with eyes to see the signs of the times and ears to hear the words of the prophets knows that is true. The Savior commended his valiant disciples, blessed are your eyes for they see, and blessed are your ears for they hear. May this blessing be ours as we listen closely to the words of the Lord through his prophets and others in this conference. I agree that we are living in the generation of perilous times just prior to the lord's advent now often when people think of the second coming they mistakenly believe that everything that has been prophesied with regards to the millennium has to occur before the messiah's appearance on the mount of olives this simply isn't true even in the church there are many who still believe that as soon as the seven angels have sounded their trumps will have the second coming, or that the seventh seal doesn't open until Christ appears on the earth. Not so. When the seventh angel in Revelation sounds, this doesn't represent Christ's final return, but it is a preparatory visit, one of a series of engagements leading up to Christ's final coming. We only need read in the header section in Revelation 8 to see that the seventh seal opens preceding the second coming, which is made clear by reading that chapter. So what is still yet to happen? Everything you see in blue. Everything in red has already happened to fulfill the ancient prophets and pronouncements. The restoration, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the gathering to Zion, temple starting the earth, a call to leave behind spiritual Babylon, the world in commotion due to the love of many waxing cold, and a general acceptance of iniquity. These have brought on an increasing number of famines, pestilences, earthquakes, thunderings, and lightnings. And this was done even before the sixth seal ended. In the seventh seal, we've witnessed the half hour of silence before greater tribulations followed all at once. For example, 2020 brought in a record number of earthquakes, thunderings, lightnings in the form of tropical storms and hurricanes. Plagues and fires also occurred through the sounding of the first four angels. In 2022, the fifth angel also sounded, and I'll cover that later during this video. My hope is that you'll recognize these events as well. You just need eyes to see and ears to hear.
Between now and Christ's coming to the Mount of Olives, the sixth and seventh angels will sound, the saints and the converted dead will rise, and the temple in Jerusalem will be measured. Then between that and his coming to all the world, even more culminating events will occur. The bad will juxtapose all the incredible blessings that will come during the millennium and even now, while the Lord's punishments are upon the wicked during the winding up scenes before Christ's reign. Remember, the seventh angel sounding represents the solemn assembly at Anamandayaman. But it isn't the start of the millennium. Rather, it is a council giving the church its marching orders as we return and report to our father Adam and to the Savior. And after the seventh trump sounds, there is yet the ministry of Christ's two witnesses, the seven plagues, and the battle of Armageddon culminating in the earthquake bringing all the continents together as Christ descends upon the Mount of Olives with a host of heavenly angels, of which also consist of the 144,000 high priests singing the new song. Please watch my seventh video in the series to gain more understanding of these topics. And as you can see in the dark blue, these are the prophecies and warnings that must occur between the Savior's return to the Mount of Olives and his final coming to all the world in his red apparel. There will be a second half hour of silence starting from that time before Christ's final coming where all those not living at least by a terrestrial law will be burned. In the meantime, the Savior will make several appearances throughout the world. The great and abominable church will be bound with the tares of the earth. There will be the building of the temples in New Jerusalem and in Jerusalem. Missionary work will continue to every nation, kindred, and tongue throughout the world. The deserts will come alive with living waters, just as Christ's living waters will quench the thirst of a world in turmoil. Among these, the Dead Sea will be healed. The Lost Ten Tribes will return, as explained in my last video. These same Lost Tribes of Israel will bring their treasures to Ephraim, among other things their scriptures testifying that Jesus is the Messiah. We won't be sure of the exact hour Christ will come, but these faithful, living a terrestrial law, will be caught up to meet the Savior at his final coming, while all corruptible things burn, leaving the uncorrupted unscathed. Now, let's briefly go over where we are about now. Remember, the Lord's various appearances will occur in the Lord's timeline. We can't predict exactly when they will all take place because no one knows for sure, but we can know the proximity based on the signs we witness. And we can access the scriptures to compare them with current events and see if they pass scrutiny. They will only pass if we have a believing heart and prayerfully ask to recognize them. For example, there are many members of the church who believe that we are still in the sixth seal. That one belief will hinder them from recognizing any of the signs of the times. Why? It's because that one false belief will keep them from watching for the signs God has shown. If you don't believe the signs are imminent, you'll dismiss them. Could this be what President Eyring meant about having eyes to see and ears to hear? If one doesn't watch for the signs, how will that person recognize them when they slap them in the face? The world is too tumultuous to pay attention to these unless you seek for this understanding and have the spirit. I remember listening to one podcaster who insisted that 2020 was not a sign of the seventh seal because we were still living in the sixth seal. That is all well and good, but this is what made me chuckle. He followed that up with a statement like, even at this time, we've recently experienced an earthquake and the sky is so hazy by all the fires this year that it's hard to breathe when you go outside. He continued that these things don't convince him that the sky was falling. I thought to myself, isn't this why the prophets wrote the scriptures for us living today? Weren't they written for our benefit to recognize the Lord's timeline? So for this podcaster and anyone else asking, 
What's with all the hype and needless worry? I sincerely ask that you follow my train of thought as I extrapolate from the books of Daniel, Revelation, and the Doctrine and Covenants. They are so straightforward in their sequence of events that I believe that if you pray for a confirmation of the things that I am about to share, that you will receive an answer and recognize the immediate need to prepare like never before for what's shortly to come. For the next few minutes, I'm going to help you see with your eyes and understand with your ears things that I have discovered things that support the words of living prophets as well as those who've prophesied in other dispensations. In this graph, you can see the seven angels John spoke of in his revelation. I did a video giving compelling evidence that the first four angels have already sounded. So in 2020 alone, the first four angels sounded their trumps. And as Daniel foretold, the temples closed. And from that, he gave some dates of the abomination of desolation. That same year, the one half hour of silence ended as depicted from the sign of the Christmas star. And as if that wasn't enough, on December 14th during Hanukkah, there was a solar eclipse in South America, exactly on the middle date of the two North American eclipses in 2017 and in 2024, given as warning signs to repent as greater judgments are about to be poured out among the wicked. The first time in this dispensation that the sign of the woman was given in the heavens was in September of 1827. In fact, it was the very night Joseph Smith received the plates from Angel Moroni, about two and a half years before Christ's church was restored. Officially recognizing the ecclesiastical formation of the kingdom of God on earth, it was given again in September of 2017 about two and a half years before we celebrated the 200 year mark of the first vision that Joseph Smith received of the Father and the Son, and when the silence in the heaven would end initiating a time of tribulation, or as this sign indicated, when the contractions would begin again in bringing it about the eventual governmental formation of the kingdom of God upon the earth. In none of my previous videos had I addressed the Ezra's Eagle prophecy, and I won't go into much detail now, except to say that there are many video explanations on the web on the prophecies of Ezra's Eagle. You might look up presentations done by Michael Rush or James Prout, or even read their books on the subject to learn more about this in detail. But I will quickly go over it now with large brush strokes, okay? Ezra, a contemporary of Daniel, wrote down his dream in 2nd Esdras chapter 11 and offers an interpretation in chapter 12. You can read this in the Apocrypha. The interpretation by some is that this eagle, representing a kingdom on the earth in the last days, is actually the United States. This tracks with many because the succession of presidents has followed suit along with the prophecy. For example, the first feather on the left of the eagle represents Herbert Hoover. Then the second feather represents Franklin Roosevelt as the longest feather due to the greatest number of terms he was elected to office. Ruler number five was a short feather, John F. Kennedy, who was assassinated. Number seven, who was also a short feather, was Nixon, who resigned and never completed his second term. Obama was the 14th feather, completing all of the rulers on the left side of the three-headed eagle. Then on the right side, we have number one, Trump, who is in office only one term, a short feather, followed by Biden, whose term will be shorter than the first. So according to this, if these scholars have produced the correct interpretation of Ezra's eagle, then sometime between now and the U.S. election of 2024, we will see its fulfillment in Biden's term being cut short. If this doesn't happen, then we'll know that this was never the correct understanding of Ezra's dream. However, if Biden's term is shortened, then fasten your seatbelts for the unraveling of our government and a lot of intrigue as it hangs by that thread. If this is the correct interpretation from those who studied Ezra's vision in greater detail than I have, then I can state that this too fits in the timeline that is unfolding before us now. So it will be interesting to see 
many things unfold in the upcoming years. One thing I know for sure is that we are living in the 7,000 year of biblical history. And this knowledge is what led me to seek to discern the signs of the times. In this light, let's review some more things that have recently been fulfilled. Now, like I mentioned, the year 2020 seems to have a lot of significance as I've compared different scriptures together. The book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, and the Doctrine and Covenants all prophesied of events that took place exclusively in the year 2020. So if you are waiting for a testimony out of the mouth of two or three witnesses for a particular year prophesied of, we have them. Add to that pronouncements from our living prophet, and it doesn't take a genius to recognize that we are living in that generation of the second coming. Tying these scriptures together has left me with no doubt that 2020 was the beginning year of the time of tribulation, which was spoken of by the prophets of the Old Testament. In section 88, 90 of the Doctrine and Covenants, it says, and also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings, and the voice of lightnings, and the voice of tempests, and the voice of the waves of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds. If we compare this to Revelation 8.1, where it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in the heaven for a half an hour. Following this half hour of silence, in verse 5, we see John's similar description. He said, And the angel took the censer, and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. Of course, 2020 had several earthquakes, but the one tremor that sticks out the most in my mind wasn't nearly the largest quake of the year. As far as severity goes, there were dozens that were worse, but there was only one that caused the trumpet to fall from the grips of the angel Moroni. It was the one that affected the icon temple of the church, even the Salt Lake City temple. So remember, this occurred in 2020. The half hour of silence by Peter's reckoning equals 20.8 years. And if we start the reckoning from the last event that was to happen during the sixth seal, being the dedication of a temple, then that brought us to the year 2020. This year, there were increases of thunders and lightnings and tempests and seas heaving themselves beyond their bounds, far worse than normal. Of course, scientists will say that these increases of natural disasters were fueled by climate change and industrial processes, etc. God works through natural laws. These increases of thunderings and lightnings fulfilled prophecy. God foresaw all this eons ago and foretold us through prophets like John and in the Doctrine and Covenants through Joseph Smith of what we were to expect. However, we know that the reasoning for these was that the world has rejected the gospel. And this is our way of knowing where we are on the Lord's timeline. This was a sign from God offering hope to believers and warnings to those who refuse to see. This is not my hypothesis, but rather my testimony that God fulfills his word. This is what John said about the fourth angel. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as a third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise as mentioned in my fourth video there was a solar eclipse on june 21st 2020 a holy day for the summer solstice it didn't go directly over jerusalem but there was a third blackout of the sun and the moon and it was dark enough to still see part of the stars now the symbolism of this was also that during this period of the COVID outbreak one third of all businesses during the day and night were no longer in operation it was also a symbol of major apostasy throughout the earth since COVID, we can see that a good percentage of individuals living by every level of light no longer shined as bright in other words 
many who were living by borrowed light or to whom church seemed like a social norm had a long enough break without any spiritual nourishment and fell being left to themselves. Of course, the other of the first three angels continued to sound their trumps as well that same year. So here is another example of how 2020 exemplified a year where prophecies were fulfilled. In DNC 88 verse 92, it says, and angels shall fly through the midst of heaven, crying with a loud voice, sounding the trump of God, saying, Prepare ye, prepare ye, O inhabitants of the earth, for the judgment of our God is come. Behold and lo, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This alludes to the seven angels sounding their trump during the seventh seal, as explained in the book of Revelation, chapter 8. The very things prophesied by John testify that we are to prepare ourselves for the bridegroom. His judgments have already begun, and this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And immediately there shall appear a great sign in heaven, and all people shall see it together. What and when was this great sign? One possibility is that it was the sign of the Christmas star that appeared on December 21st, 2020. This was the very date the half hour of silence ended from calculating the time of the dedication of the Palmyra Temple on April 6, 2000. It was the same alignment of stars that created the new star as it appeared to announce Christ's birth over 2000 years ago. It was the star that emerged on the very day marking the end of the first half hour of silence according to our calendar now another preceding sign that the scripture could represent is when the lord in the not too distant future saves the jewish nation from the battle of armageddon what greater sign from heaven would there be all men from earth would experience the great earthquake bringing all seven continents into one land mass it would be in fulfillment of heavenly prophecy and thus all people would see it together this too would precipitate the fulfillment that is explained in verse 94. it reads and another angel shall sound his trump saying that great church, the mother of abominations, that made nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, that persecuteth the saints of God, that shed their blood, she who sitteth upon many waters, and upon the islands of the sea, behold, she is the tares of the earth. She is bound in bundles, her bounds are made strong, no man can loose them, therefore, she is ready to be burned and he shall sound his trump both long and loud and all nations shall hear it there is no question that after the savior appears on the mount of olives and after the great earthquake that brings the continents together that this sign will be enough so that no religious organization except the saviors will be recognized at this point he will claim his own this is how the great and abominable church or the church of babylon will be bound tight in bundles ready to be burned however the burning won't come until after the savior's final appearance to the world this leads us up to the second silence in heaven and there shall be a silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour and immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded as a scroll is unfolded after it is rolled up and the face of the lord shall be unveiled remember how in my first video in this series how i spoke about harmonizing the scriptures that deal with the events leading up to the second coming as we put these events in chronological order we discover that the silence in heaven spoken about on the top under Revelation 8 through 14 doesn't fit into the same chronological order of the silence in heaven spoken of in section 88. Thus, there shall be time between Christ's coming to the Mount of Olives and his final coming to all the world. I want to finish my thought about the fulfilled prophecy in the scriptures. Let's look at the prophecies of Daniel. In Daniel 2.34, Daniel spoke about the kingdom of God coming forth which we understand to be the restoration after a long night of apostasy. Daniel said that the setting up of God's kingdom would occur in a day when only ten kingdoms would exist from what was once 
the Roman Empire, which would be an offshoot of the Babylonian Empire from Daniel's day. The earthly kingdoms would be represented by the toes of iron and clay. There was only a brief moment in history when there were only ten kingdoms that either broke off from or who then had sovereignty over what was once part of that great Roman Empire, which came from the Babylonian Empire. So at the beginning of the imperialistic 19th century, there were 11 empires ruling the world. The only one not originally associated with the Roman Empire was Russia. The other 10 could be tied back to the geography of what was once the Roman Empire. So these 10 toes of iron and clay were to represent the kingdoms of the world that existed at the time of the first vision of Joseph Smith, where Christ, who was the stone, who was cut out of the mountain without hands, began to set up the kingdom of God on earth once again. The gospel wasn't restored through the authority of the Bible. It was restored by the authority of Jesus Christ. And when that moment arrived, God began to fulfill his word just as Daniel had spoken it. It would eventually fill the entire earth. This started in 1820 and will be completely fulfilled during the millennium when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. And when Christ will reign King of Kings, then in Daniel 8, we see the 2300 day prophecy, starting from the time of Artaxerxes, who began the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem as found in Ezra chapters 7 and 8. We begin at the countdown by converting 2300 days into years. Well, this adds up to the year of 1846, and this was when the Nauvoo Temple was dedicated. That same year that the ordinances stopped as the saints moved west in a forced exodus. The temple was burned in 1848 and was destroyed by a tornado shortly thereafter. Here again, Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled. My video number eight goes into this in more detail. Then there are the prophecies of the 70 weeks from the command to rebuild Jerusalem. So the first 70 week time frame began in 555 BC when Artaxerxes mandated the reconstruction of Jerusalem after it was destroyed by the Babylonians. This mandate does not start from Cyrus, who lived in the time of Daniel and who authorized the Jews to return after 70 years in exile to rebuild the temple. The rebuilding actually occurred much later. Things had been delayed and it was Artaxerxes who ruled by the time the temple was constructed. The 70 week countdown includes the 590 years as it took a common Hebrewism to interchange a week into a seven year period. Thus, the 69 weeks culminated with Christ's ministry and his crucifixion matching with the end date of the 483 year period since Artaxerxes command. In the seven years following, Christians received unparalleled persecution. Now, this brings us to the second fulfillment of this prophecy. It began in 1537 when the reconstruction started under Soliman the Magnificent after the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD. So, 483 years after this decree, the temples all closed on March 25th, 2020, just as Daniel prophesied. He then prophesied of the seven years of tribulation and wars that would follow leading up to the abomination of desolation. And then in his prophecy found in Daniel 12, he again confirms the seven year period of tribulation beginning in 2020, because this is when the ordinances ceased, which match his countdown date. I'll go into that in a little more detail shortly, but here again, the year 2020 figures into prophecy and shows that the seven year period goes from 2020 to 2027. This gives us time for the seven angels to sound their trumps for the first three and a half years, which would culminate around the time that Christ and Adam come to Adam on Diamond for the solemn assembly. And that still leaves time for the three and a half year ministry of the two witnesses 
leading up to Christ's coming to the Mount of Olives. Again, I have faith that just as the other prophecies of Daniel were fulfilled, so will the events of the seven-year period when the abomination shall be left desolate. Now let's go to the Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, 28 through 31, to discover another prophecy that was fulfilled in the year 2020, again showing us the time in which we live. Quote, And when the times of the Gentiles has come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. But they, referring to the Jewish nation, receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled." Unquote. Now, what is that generation being spoken of, that the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled? It isn't the generation when the Restoration began in 1820. This generation begins in a time when the remnant of Israel gathers back into Jerusalem. We get this from verse 24 and 25, because therein it states, quote, And this I have told you concerning Jerusalem, and when that day shall come, shall the remnant be scattered among all nations, but they shall be gathered again, but they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, unquote. So, when did Israel or the Jews really start to gather again? It was when Jerusalem became a state. According to myjewishlearning.com, in the article titled The Mass Migration to Israel of the 1950s, after Israel became a state in 1948, quote, some 688,000 immigrants came to Israel during the country's first three and a half years, an average of close to 200,000 a year, as approximately 650,000 Jews lived in Israel at the time of the establishment of the state. This meant, in effect, a doubling of the Jewish population, unquote. Keep this in mind as I read verse 31, quote, and there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they see an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land." COVID-19 and the strains that have followed is that plague because the scripture refers to men standing in the generation of the Jews returning to Israel, which happened in a grand scale when Israel became a recognized state. Thus, men living then wouldn't all pass away until they saw an overflowing scourge or a desolating sickness that covers the land. Well, almost 72 years after Israel became a state, near the end of that generation, in the nick of time for this prophecy to be fulfilled, COVID became that overflowing scourge. Overflowing is another way of saying that it will cover the entire earth. It was unleashed at the end of 2019, but hit full speed covering the entire earth by 2020, when the entire world shut down in order to slow down the death toll. So again, this is a witness from the Doctrine and Covenants that the events of 2020 had been foreseen by the Lord. Thus, according to modern scriptures, we know that the time of the Gentiles is about to end. And what is the time of the Gentiles ending? It is when the Jews start accepting the gospel. And a generation is the amount of time people live at a given moment in history. In biblical times, that would have been 30 years. In modern times, it could be 100 years. Again, this confirms the time in which we live. Are you beginning to see a pattern of scriptures being fulfilled? I remember reading in Helaman chapters 13 through 15 over 40 years ago and digesting the prophecies of Samuel the Lamanite and thinking, wow, this is just five years before Christ's birth. And these guys have no clue just how close they are to Christ's first coming. I thought, how cool it must have been for that generation to see everything leading up to the Savior's appearance to the temple in the land of Bountiful. Now, here we are, again, very close 
to major prophecies being fulfilled prior to the Lord's second coming. And I say this with conviction because there are a couple of other things that have come to light since my previous videos that I feel are important to share that also point to now. First, in my previous videos, I didn't mention any role that China might play in the winding up scenes before Adam on Diamond. Well, someone had asked me about this, and I responded that everything that I had studied up to that point didn't mention the People's Republic of China as being part of the names mentioned in the Bible. But it was very possible that these scholars were incorrect in some other designation of ancient lands. I thought that this would be odd not to have such a powerful government not even be cited. So I did some more digging. What I uncovered was that there was a lot more controversy about some of the names designated to ancient places than I had originally thought. One website that many Bible readers use is BibleAtlas.org to see exactly where biblical lands were located. For example, if you type in Torgarma under the Bible search, among other passages, you'll see that Togarma is mentioned in Ezekiel 38, where he prophesies of the end time wars just prior to Christ's return. So most of the geographical names are better known if they were mentioned in Bible passages in the last 2,500 years, but not necessarily known previous to that. So let's look at the Atlas search. And Togarma, we could see that it's in Persia, Tarshish, and Ephesus. And so sometimes the names of the places are no more than best guesses. For example, Gomer and Meshik have been placed in Kazakhstan as well as associated with Korea and Japan and Persia. But in other sources, we can see things where Japheth's descendants became the Chinese. You see, Gomer Meshek and Togarma were descendants of Noah's son Japheth, who many scholars believe to be the forefathers of the peoples of the Asian continent, including China. So it appears that there is no consensus on some of these ancient peoples and whether they represent the forefathers of China, Korea, or Japan. Other than guessing, which is what many scholars have done, we should have open minds as events play out in the last days and realize that some geographies may not coincide with modern thought as to where these locations once existed. We know that God revealed these places to ancient prophets who knew where these people were and what they were called at that point in history. So what was understood by the people in Ezekiel's day may not coincide with what is commonly believed today. Thus, it is characteristically human to rename a city after an existing populated area located in another part of the world. For example, because of our love for Paris, France, in the US, there are 23 municipalities called Paris. The point is that there was probably more than one place called Togarma or Meshach or Gomer in the ancient world as well. So even though the exact locations for many of these names have been lost over the thousands of years of history, we should be open to expanding the players taking part in the winding up scenes. For example, looking at the world today, we know that China will factor a major role in the winding up scenes simply because Xi Jinping, China's president, desires his country to become the de facto superpower of the world. I'm sure Ezekiel, Daniel, and John the Revelator saw China in their visions of the last days. Let me develop why I say this. Currently, we see that Xi Jinping is trying to create a one world government to strengthen his influence. You might want to read an article found in Modern Diplomacy titled The Theory of Forming One World Government Under the Vision of Xi Jinping to get a greater understanding. You just need to do a Google search to find that. Of course, Xi Jinping would like to be the world leader. He is creating alliances with North Korea, Russia, India, Northern Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. In fact, he's spearheading 
several summits with these leaders recently. This very movement was prophesied of as being an antichrist movement, a counterfeit movement to the kingdom of God. We can read in Daniel 7, 16 through 24, that it is to take place before the Ancient of Days comes. We know that the Ancient of Days is Adam, who shall preside at Adam on Diamon. Thus, this movement shall take place before the solemn assembly when Christ will receive reports from all dispensations and be crowned King of Kings. So this is the timeline. This is what John the Revelator referred to as the seventh angel sounding his trump. When Christ will receive reports through Adam for every dispensation. And it is when Christ will be crowned King of Kings. In 2018, Xi Jinping passed a law in China eliminating the two-term limit on China's presidency, effectively allowing him to remain in office until his death since he's elected by the National People's Congress of only around 3,000 delegates, representing the 1.4 billion people who reside in the country. He feels it is his destiny to bring the entire world under one government. In 2021, Xi Jinping declared to China's military that they should be ready for war at any second. He's backed that up with a continual rise in military spending to $230 billion a year in 2022. While it is less than what we spend in the U.S., it marks an exponential increase from before the time he took power. Xi Jinping is also demanding the reunification with Taiwan, whose majority don't want to lose the freedoms they currently have by becoming part of a communist dictatorship. He is threatening military action, just like what Russia did with the Ukraine earlier this year. There are currently 4 million troops in China's military, which is twice the number that we have in the U.S. His closest allies include Russia with 3.5 million soldiers in their reserve and military, Iran with their 1 million troops, and North Korea boasting more than 7.7 .7 million in total. The U.S. has pledged to protect Taiwan. I just want to make China understand that we are not going to step back. We are not going to change any of our views. So are you China. saying that, that the United States would come to Taiwan's defense if yes, China attacked? We, yes, we have a commitment to do that. So this could be a powder keg waiting to explode. The future really depends on the hubris of Xi Jinping and the risks he's willing to take. Of course, we also know that Iran, North Korea, and Russia all have malice against the U.S., so it may not take too much provocation for them to unite against us in some conflict. I gave you this background so that you might recognize that China's government is and will be one of the antichrists that ancient prophets saw in vision. Thus, the fifth angel has just sounded his trump with all that has taken place in China recently. Let's read in Revelation 9, 3 through 5, and see if you recognize this as well. Quote, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented for five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man." Unquote. This was absolutely fulfilled in China with the food shortages accompanying their forced quarantine during the year 2022. The police, looking like locusts in their face masks and Tyvek suits, are not hurting the grass or any green thing. They simply enforced a quarantine, triggering extreme hunger amongst Chinese citizens. This is just as the swarms of locusts caused great hunger in one of the plagues of Moses, 
for example. Let's look at the city of Shanghai with the involuntary confinement of its 14 million citizens from the end of March to the beginning of June 2022. Reports were that these forced lockdowns halted their economy and people hadn't been able to leave their homes, let alone open their doors to even buy food, which by all reports was extremely limited. Commodities could scarcely be ordered online because the circuits were too busy. Western news agencies reported cases where families had only received rations of five carrots, a stock of bok choy, and a chicken from a government drop-off program. At most, they could subsist off of that for three to four days with a lot of hunger pains. But no more deliveries came for another two weeks, causing excruciating hunger. Imagine this being replicated millions upon millions of times over. Watch the following news report. Some citizens in the authoritarian nation are losing it, defying the lockdown by screaming from their apartment windows into the night. It's straight out of a dystopian sci-fi movie. Some people are yelling out, we're starving. Uh, tomorrow it's gonna be a bit worrying. We're only eating white rice, but it's still food. I heard about the chiang chai thing, which people are doing in the wee hours of the morning. So I tried doing that also to no avail for two days really successively. I woke up at like five, 10 minutes before the um, 6 a.m. when it starts, right? So then, like, you can see the whole system clocked up because, like, as you try to check out and buy the, the groceries online, it's like, it keeps saying that it's busy, like, there, there are too many people accessing the app. This lockdown was unprecedented in human history. At this scale, at this level, at this day and age, many people in Shanghai were accustomed to living at the upper portions of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? These are people for, for the, who, for the most part, probably never truly experienced food or water insecurity in their lives, but for the first time experienced true food insecurity. Other cities were shut down completely as well as new widespread outbreaks began there during a five-month period from the last week of March to the middle of September. In analyzing this prophecy, let's first look at the locusts. When Moses sent the plague of locusts to the Egyptians, swarms of these pests destroyed the crops and plants and the food supply. Well, John metaphorically also used locusts to describe combatants that would make food scarce. Only this time, locusts wouldn't hurt the trees or plants as they did anciently, but the results would be the same as people couldn't get food due to this calamity. A zero tolerance of COVID infections in China shut down businesses and the people's ability to readily access food. John prophesied that this woe would only affect those who didn't have the seal of God on their foreheads. Therefore, this affliction would take place in a country where there weren't many members of the church. This incidence fits this criteria. China has 1.4 billion inhabitants, and other than Hong Kong or Taiwan, where they had enjoyed spiritual freedoms in the past, there are few members of the church on the mainland where religious liberties are not allowed. This five-month national quarantine may have prevented deaths from the virus, but many sought death due to hunger pangs, even though it did not come. Luckily, this five-month period didn't affect everyone at once. Had it, there would be few alive. However, it was a plague that affected several hundred million Chinese for around five months where several cities shut down one after another for differing lengths of time, causing great distress and feelings of hopelessness as people became imprisoned in their homes, lacking 
sufficient food. This led to many disturbances being squelched by the police. This doesn't even account for the problems of unemployment and a halt in manufacturing triggering shortages. And imagine the emotional and mental toll this would inflict upon people. This makes what we went through in the U.S. during the worst of the COVID outbreak look like a minor hassle. Imagine having such tight control that you couldn't even open your front door or back door under any circumstance without severe repercussions. Everything fit the conditions that the prophecy of John described. The scourge is likened to the sting of a scorpion tormenting people. Remember, Scorpion stings are usually not deadly, but they cause pain and discomfort, and it takes time to recover. These events certainly fit into the description and the timeline of the five months is accurate, as well as the fact that the fourth angel sounded his trump in 2020, and then later in 2022, the fifth angel sounded. And yet, this is not something that most might realize because they never bothered to look for the sign of the fifth trumpet sounding. They didn't look because they still don't recognize that the first four angels had already sounded. Is it a wonder that ancient prophets predicted Christ's coming would occur as a thief in the night for the unwise? President Eyring's observation of people having eyes to see but don't and having ears to hear but are deafened speaks plainly to the world in which we live. Do we know people who are in denial and who think that the sounding of the trumps is still a long ways off? Let's read more from Revelation 9 to uncover in greater detail about how literal this fulfillment was. Quote, verse 7, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses preparing unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, the breastplates of iron. And the sound of the wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Could a motorcycle officer be a modern description of an ancient soldier mounting a horse preparing to battle? Could the crown of gold be a motorcycle helmet? Could the face of men and hair of women denote that both sexes are involved in getting on their motorbikes to enforce the quarantine? Could the teeth of lions connote the power and authority given to law enforcement to injure the non-compliant just as a lion would take hold with his teeth to control its prey? And could the wings be the motorcycle handles and the throttles on them cause the bike to sound like chariots and many horses running to battle? Could the breastplates be bulletproof vests? And finally, could the red light on the back of every police cycle in China be compared to a scorpion's tail with a stinger? And could the siren denote the hissing sound scorpions make before the strike? Now, when I did my video on the fifth angel sounding his trump, I admitted that I had no idea how this would play out. I gave possibilities to look for, but I was only postulating. Now that it has been fulfilled, the scriptures make complete sense. Before, I hadn't yet made the connection to the locusts of Moses causing hunger and to the locusts of this time period also causing hunger. Now I see this as a perfect simile. So it wasn't a war-related invasion with chemical warfare, nor the poisoning of a tobacco crop, but it consisted of oppression from the government head that caused torment to over a billion of his own people. Just as the Lord did with other angels sounding their trumps, reality played out more subtle than most imagine, at least here in the Western Hemisphere. And yet, here we are, within the time frame prophesied of and on track to have future things fulfilled just as John and other ancient prophets described. Even the state of the world is a witness that the evil have ripened in iniquity. 
It appears that the world is as wicked today as the Nephites were before their times of destruction, and how ancient Israel had been before their sufferings, and in some cases prior to their almost complete annihilation by malicious forces for the sake of evil. It wasn't that the Lord took pleasure in any of their destructions. These were just natural consequences of entire nations choosing evil over good. The costs back then are the same as they will be shortly. God will suffer the wicked to kill the wicked in order that the survivors might repent and turn to him. Revelation 9 verse 11 gives us a glimpse of the future and the role China will play shortly. Quote, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon." Unquote. If this lockdown is the fulfillment of the fifth angel sounding his trump, then we have no choice but to extrapolate that since the president of the People's Republic of China is the cause of this woe, then in the English tongue his name would be Xi Jinping, the president there since 2013. This sets the stage for him being one of the perpetrators of the wars which John saw as a sixth angel and of whom Daniel also foretold in chapter 11 of his book. This brings us to other current events. Remember, Taiwan wants to maintain their independence from China while China wants to assert power over them, just as they did in Hong Kong. Just to demonstrate how tenuous this situation might be, I'm going to share a brief clip from 60 Minutes Australia. Victor Gao is represented as an unofficial spokesman for China and is currently the vice president of the China and Globalization Think Tank. He was a former interpreter for Deng Xiaoping, a revolutionary leader and the paramount leader of the People's Republic of China from 1978 to 1992. He said the following in a television interview. Those who want to block China's unification with China's Taiwan will be doomed to failure. If the US does intervene in Taiwan and Australia supports them, what will happen to Australia? Listen, if Australia goes to fight together with the U.S. soldiers in China's drive for reunification between China's mainland and China's Taiwan, then you are talking about the worst thing you can dream of. A war between China and the United States will soon escalate out of control, and that will be Armageddon, Armageddon, and Armageddon. And this is what I hope the Australian people will come to realize, that you need to deal with China with respect as much as you give to the United States. I think most Christians are aware that the world is full of commotion and feel the second coming must be close. But few recognize how the scriptures are literally being fulfilled today to every wit what a blessing to see things from the light of the restoration and having the faith and understanding that those who fear the Lord shall look and see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth, as it says in Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, verses 39 and 40. This, while the angels fly through the midst of heaven, as described in Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, and in Revelation, chapters 8 through 10. Now, let's go back and review Daniel 12 so that we can get more insight on what is shortly to happen. After seeing the wars of destruction prior to the Lord's second coming, Daniel really wanted to know the particulars, and so he prayed for this knowledge. And this is what the Lord gave him in reply. I'm going to quote the contemporary English version from Daniel 12, 8 through 13, because it is more understandable. But I'll keep the King James Version on the screen for comparison's sake. It reads, quote, I heard what the angel said, but I didn't understand. So I asked, Sir, how will it all end? The angel in my vision then replied, Daniel, go about your business, because the meaning of this message will remain secret until the end of time. 
many people will have their hearts and lives made pure and clean, but those who are evil will keep on being evil and never understand. Only the wise will understand." Unquote. To put these verses into greater context, let me read the synopsis as given in the LDS scriptures for Daniel 12. Quote, in the last days, Michael will deliver Israel from their troubles. And then it says, the wise will know the times and the meanings of his visions, unquote. Daniel not only wondered how would all end, but he wondered about the timing of the abomination of desolation just prior to the second coming. So basically he's told not to worry because these things won't be revealed until the time just before all this is to occur. But then he talks about that time and sees that there will be many who will be purified and made white in spite of the blood and sins of that generation, which is referring to our generation living on earth now. Remember, Elder Rasband confirmed that we are the people, and President Nelson has verified that we are that generation that Nephi saw a vision of the last days. How are we purified and made white? Well, it is done through the sacred ordinances of baptism, the sacrament, and of the temple, and our living up to those covenants. And then later, when the calamity shall come in an even greater magnitude than now, we will be made white by enduring in faith. Christ will restore every priesthood key that we currently don't have access to, including that of translation. We will see greater miracles occur through the fullness of the priesthood than ever before witnessed since Christ ministered among the Nephites. Of important note to us, the wise, we shall understand the exact timing of these things because the timing of these things is linked to a particular event. If we discard this event through rationalization and believing that we aren't there yet, it will only be because we are not humble enough yet to receive confirmation of this. And I submit to you that to be wise in Heavenly Father's eyes, we need to have a broken heart and contrite spirit recognizing our faults, so that we might be worthy to listen to what the Spirit dictates. We need to put aside our preconceptions, for it is only the humble and the faithful that will receive this clarity. And then they must prepare themselves spiritually and physically for what is to come. Thus, my only advice to anyone watching this is to search your soul. Are you of that mind and heart so that you can have this event confirmed to your heart and mind through the Holy Ghost? Verse 11, quote, There will be 1290 days from the time that the daily sacrifices are stopped until someone sets up the horrible thing that causes destruction. So, what is the event that starts the countdown to the sixth angel sounding his trump when the abomination will make desolate or that horrible thing that causes destruction? The daily sacrifice, of course, refers to the temple ordinances. He's talking about the day that the daily sacrifice is taken away. What day were all the temples closed and the daily sacrifice taken away due to COVID-19? It was March 25th, 2020. And what day marks the 1290 days after that? 1290 days after that is three and a half years later. And this brings us to October 6th, 2023. This date is the time given for the second woe that John the Revelator referred to because it is coming in the middle of the tribulation period. Unlike the first woe in China, this one will affect just about every nation, including the United States. So what is this second woe? This refers to the great wars that will take place where, according to John, one-third of the Earth's inhabitants will be destroyed. Now, please understand that this is not the Battle of Armageddon. That won't come until even later. I spoke of other players in my fifth video from the Middle East that will play part in that, and who will also be involved in the sixth woe. We only know this because John prophesied that there would be four angels or people from the Euphrates River that would sound the trump for these wars. 
And Psalms 83 also mention these same players lining things up in other wars before the last battle. Thus, there will be more than one aggressor, and the result is that the whole world will be in even worse commotion. We only need read in Revelation 9 and Daniel 11 to understand these upcoming atrocities. We can also read in the books of Esdras chapters 11 and 12 and the book of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 for similar accounts. Now, verse 12 of Daniel, quote, God will bless everyone who patiently waits until 1335 days have gone by. This is an additional 45 days after October 6th, which brings us to November 20th, 2023. Now, this is if these days are literally days. If these days are a substitute for weeks, then that would be another 24 years. Now, if it is by November 20th, 2023, I hope that by then there would be a ceasefire that makes November 20th so special. However, let me bring a message of peace and hope that accompanies this. We also know a principle that Jacob spoke about in 2 Nephi 30.10. He said, For the time speedily cometh that the Lord God shall cause a great division among the people, and the wicked will he destroy, and he will spare his people. Yea, even if it so be that he must destroy the wicked by fire. Again, this signifies that if we continue trying to be as righteous as possible, and as we heed the counsel of the prophets, that we are promised to be spared. Time will tell exactly how everything will play out here. We are very close to it, and we won't have to wait long. But the righteous need not fear. Verse 13. So Daniel, be faithful until the end. You will rest, and at the end of time, you will rise from death and receive your reward. The obedient who persevere through this will receive their lot to be worthy to stand and greet the Savior at the end of days, before the world transforms back into its terrestrial state. After this state, there will be the council at Adam on Diamond, and then another three and a half year time period when the two witnesses will minister in Jerusalem. And then after more plagues, the battle of Armageddon will commence, and then Christ will appear on the Mount of Olives, and the hosts of angels sing. Wow. Do you see how close we are to the sixth angel sounding his trump? According to Daniel and Ezra, it is going to happen very soon. I've never been more certain of anything more than the fact that we are in the winding up years now. Although even with this knowledge, I wish that I was more prepared. So with this in mind, listen very carefully to the words of President Russell M. Nelson at the October 2022 General Conference so that you can best prepare yourself for that which is shortly to come. Dear brothers and sisters, God is the source of all truth. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints embraces all truth that God conveys to his children, whether learned in a scientific laboratory or received by direct revelation from him. The truth is that it is much more exhausting to seek happiness where you can never find it. However, when you yoke yourself to Jesus Christ and do the spiritual work required to overcome the world, he and he alone does have the power to lift you above the pull of this world. Now, how does overcoming the world bless our lives? The answer is clear. Entering into a covenant relationship with God binds us to Him in a way that makes everything about life easier. Please do not misunderstand me. I did not say that making covenants makes life easy. In fact, expect opposition. 
because the adversary does not want you to discover the power of Jesus Christ. But yoking yourself with a Savior means you have access to his strength and redeeming power. Then to members of the entire church, the same charge I gave to our young adults last May. I urged them then, and I plead with you now, to take charge of your own testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Work for it, nurture it so that it will grow, feed it truth, don't pollute it with false philosophies of unbelieving men and women. As you make the continual strengthening of your testimony of Jesus Christ your highest priority, watch for miracles to happen in your life. My plea to you this morning is to find rest from the intensity, uncertainty, and anguish of this world by overcoming the world through your covenants with God. Let him know through your prayers and your actions that you are serious about overcoming the world. Ask him to enlighten your mind and send the help you need. Each day record the thoughts that come to you as you pray. Then follow through diligently. Spend more time in the temple and seek to understand how the temple teaches you how to rise above this fallen world. As I've stated before, the gathering of Israel is the most important work taking place on earth today. One crucial element of this gathering is preparing a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again a people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world, a people who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws of Jesus Christ. I call upon you, my dear brothers and sisters, to become this righteous people. Cherish and honor your covenant above all other commitments. As you let God prevail in your life, I promise you greater peace, confidence, joy, and yes, rest. With the power of the Holy Apostleship vested in me, I bless you in your quest to overcome this world. I bless you to increase your faith in Jesus Christ and learn better how to draw upon his power. I bless you to be able to discern truth from error. I bless you to care more about the things of God than the things of this world. I bless you to see the needs of those around you and strengthen those you love because Jesus Christ overcame this world, you can too. After showing the video of Christ coming to the temple at Bountiful among the Nephites, President Nelson said, It is significant that the Savior chose to appear to the people at the temple. It is his house. It is filled with his power. Let us never lose sight of what the Lord is doing for us now. He is making his temples more accessible. My dear brothers and sisters, may you focus on the temple in ways you never have before. I bless you to grow closer to God and Jesus Christ every day. I love you. May God be with you till we meet again. I pray in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It looks like we have our to-do list from the prophet. One, we are to acknowledge that God is the source of all truth. 
two, we are to take charge of our own testimony of Jesus Christ and his church. Work for it. Nurture it so it will grow. This is to be our highest priority. Three, don't pollute our testimonies by listening to false philosophies of unbelieving men and women. Four, expect miracles to happen. Five, overcome the world through prayer and actions keeping covenants and pray for the ability to overcome the world. Six, record thoughts and impressions received as you pray and follow through diligently. Seven, attend the temple more often than ever and seek to understand how the temple teaches you to rise above this fallen world. Eight, prepare yourself to be ready to meet the Savior when he comes. 9. Let God prevail in your life. And 10. Never lose sight of what the Lord is doing for us now. I have faith that if we follow this list, that we'll be spiritually prepared for the times ahead. Come what may, and we will make it out just fine if we follow the counsel of the prophet. God will help us as we ask. If we get in the habit of seeking the Lord now, then when life becomes even more uncertain, we will be prepared for God's tender mercies and outright miracles. As President Nelson said, that the gathering of Israel is the most important work taking place on the earth today, I couldn't help but to think of Christ's conversation with the Jews. In Matthew 21, 43 through 44, Christ explained, to the Jewish branch of the house of Israel. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder." Unquote. This last verse refers to the vision Daniel interpreted from Nebuchadnezzar as it talks about the stone that shall be cut out of the mountain and roll to fill the whole earth. Remember, stone is a symbol of Jesus Christ. Thus, it is Christ's kingdom that will grind all else to powder. This is one of the definitions signifying that the arm of the Lord will be revealed. This is why I believe President Nelson has such urgency in his voice. May we all prepare ourselves for that which is to come shortly. This is my prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This concludes my ninth video in the series. I hadn't planned on a tenth video, but there is still more to say. It is timely, and I pray that every Latter-day Saint consider these things, as time is running out sooner now than when the prophet pronounced it back in April of 2019. In my next video, I will go over what will take place during the millennium and beyond.